Thank you for joining me today for a webinar on understanding hearing loss and how masks impact everyone's communication. This topic is really important as we all collectively realize that wearing masks has several unfortunately negative impacts on the way that we're interacting with each other and the way that we're communicating. And if I, or if a loved one, or my patient, has a hearing loss, the impact is twice as bad. So hopefully through this webinar, you'll learn more about the situation at hand, have a better understanding of the science behind the challenge, as well as gain some very practical strategies for improving our communications as we go forward. My name is Patricia Johnson. I'm an assistant clinical professor at UNC. I provide courses on hearing technology in our doctoral program at UNC, and I also provide diagnostic and rehabilitative hearing services for adults at the UNC Hearing and Communication Center. What is an audiologist? In case you're not familiar with this profession, it's a healthcare professional who evaluates, diagnoses, treats, and manages hearing loss and balance disorders for children and adults. The entry-level degree for an audiologist is a four-year doctorate degree after undergraduate. And we work in all sorts of environments, hospital settings, schools, private practice clinics, and industry. And this image here is one of our doctoral students working with a child who's having their hearing tested via a game that they play together. This is where I work, the UNC Hearing and Communication Center. It is a faculty practice in the UNC School of Medicine it's our primary training site for our students as they begin their clinical rotations, but we function as a fully self-supported nonprofit clinic, and we have quite an engagement with the community. Just some information there if you are interested in learning more about our practice. What comes to mind when you think of hearing loss? There's probably two things that you immediately think of. The first is advanced age, maybe a beloved grandmother, neighbor who is leaning in and saying, huh, what are you saying? Who's having difficulty hearing. You may also immediately think about sign language or someone who's part of the deaf community who uses American Sign Language as their primary form of communication. With sign language, it is very obvious that the person is part of the deaf community because it's a very visual language. What I want to use this opportunity is to say that you actually are probably unaware of how many people in your local community have a hearing loss. It impacts individuals of any age, not just the elderly, although there is a strong association between age and hearing loss. Many children are born with hearing loss. It's acquired from noise exposure, illnesses, medications. They often call hearing loss the invisible disability because unlike other types of physical differences, hearing loss loss is not usually visible from the outside of the head, so you probably aren't even aware how many people in your environment have hearing loss. Just some brief statistics about hearing loss. It is highly correlated to aging, but these types of changes in degradation in the auditory system begin even in our 40s and 50s. But by the time you're 80, it's about 80% of these individuals have some amount of hearing loss. So this is impacting millions of people around the US. It's the third most prevalent chronic condition as we are aging, and yet it probably garners the least amount of attention relative to things like heart disease, partly because things like heart disease are considerably more fatal, but hearing loss that goes untreated has a significant impact on individuals' overall wellness, health, and certainly emotional wellness as well. So let's go through a brief anatomy and physiology of the ear because it sets the stage to better understand hearing loss. What can go wrong in the anatomy to cause a hearing loss, which will further give us understanding as we talk about communication. So here's the auditory system. We have the outer ear, the part that you can see, the pinna, which funnels sound from the environment, which then travels down through the ear canal, assuming there's not a nice glob of earwax. There the sound will continue to travel down and eventually hit the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, which is actually several layers of taut skin that collects the sound further. And now it translates it from sound waves into mechanical energy. On the opposite side of the eardrum are these little tiny bones called the ossicles. They in turn rock back and forth on an axis the very end of the little bones, the little stirrup, or what we call the stapes, is connected to the inner ear. 
That bony labyrinth, the snail shell section, is called the cochlea. It is filled with fluid and membranes and tiny hair cells that further transmit the sound through the auditory pathway. You can imagine these little hair cells like seaweed in the ocean. And as the fluid is displaced, as it moves back and forth, that sloshes around. The little hair cells also slosh back and forth. They get excited, they get stimulated, and they trigger the auditory nerve, which then carries the sound up to the brain, the auditory cortex. And it becomes infinitely more complicated once we think about how the brain decodes that sound. As you can see, it's very complex. The more we learn about the ear, the more it seems like a miracle that any of us hear at all, because so many of these little dominoes have to fall in perfect alignment with perfect timing in order for us to perceive sound. And if we were to move a domino at any point along the pathway, we have a hearing loss. Now, hearing loss that happens at the beginning of this pathway, the ear canal, the eardrum, the middle ear space just behind the eardrum, if anything happens there, we call that a conductive hearing loss. And that type of hearing loss can be corrected by medicine or by surgery. So if I find that someone has a hearing loss in that region, I'm going to refer them to their primary care physician, or I will refer them to an ear, nose, and throat doctor who may prescribe a medicine to treat the infection. If the little ossicles, those little bones are damaged, they may even do surgical correction and put in a prosthetic in place of the little bones. But that's only about 15% of all hearing loss. For everyone else, the hearing loss is originating in the cochlea or the auditory nerve. That's what we call a sensory neural hearing loss. So let's zoom in. Here's a picture of those little hair cells, or actually the tips of them, the stereocilia. When we're born, they're all in nice, neat little rows, little tight bundles like this, and we have a finite number of them. So we only have so many, and over time, what happens is that these little stereocilia become damaged. As you can see from this picture, in contrast to the previous one, several of them are keeled over, they're bent. The little rows are all broken up like someone has done a bad job mowing the lawn. In some cases, the stereocilia are completely missing. This is really, really important when it comes to understanding the impact of a sensory neural hearing loss because they don't come back. Once these little hair cells are damaged, they do not grow back unless you're a bird or a frog. And which stereocilia are damaged and along the pathway where in the cochlea they are damaged, that directly translates to how well the person hears, how much they can perceive soft sounds and whether they're having difficulty hearing low or high pitched sounds. This is also another reason why two people with hearing loss may behave or function entirely different from each other. Yes, they both have some amount of hearing loss, but they may have entirely different numbers of the remaining hair cells. So just know that hearing loss is much more complicated than we sometimes give it credit for, and that can contribute to why some people do really well with hearing aids, and others may need to move to something like a cochlear implant why some people benefit from a little bit of a boost in sound and others to continue to perceive sound as highly distorted or unclear. If we were to roll out that snail shell, it's like the keys of a piano. And what I mean by that is that it's tonotopic. Some of these little hair cells are tuned to high pitch sounds. And as we go down, it goes to low pitch sounds which is why I said before that depending on which of the hair cells are damaged, you may then lose your access to either low or high pitch sounds. Hold that thought in your mind because that'll be important as we talk about speech understanding in a few minutes. In summary, sensory neural hearing loss is about 85% of all hearing losses. It's almost always permanent. And for the vast majority of us, it's a very gradual loss of those hair cells. It's a gradual decline as we get older, happens over decades. It happens very slowly. It sneaks up on people, unless you've had exposure to very loud noise or a sudden illness that has attacked the hair cells much more quickly. Typically, it impacts high-pitched sounds first. You will start to lose your ability to hear soft, everyday sounds like the ding that the microwave is ready, the turn signal in your car. And depending on the number of the little hair cells that are missing, individuals began to lose the clarity of speech. Every day my patients tell me the same thing. 
I know someone is talking to me, but I'm having difficulty understanding what they're saying. And if you're having trouble in quiet, it goes without saying, when we get into background noise, it's going to be even more challenging. Although I do have a significant number of patients who have otherwise normal hearing in quiet, but then struggle greatly in background noise as well. This graph is the audiogram. From left to right, we have the low bass pitches, the high treble pitches in hertz. And then from the top of the graph to the bottom is intensity, very soft sounds to loud sounds. When I test someone's hearing, if I put you in a booth and say, raise your hand when you hear the tones, what I'm trying to find out is how well you can hear sound. At what level can you detect a sound? If you can detect a very soft sound, we mark that little threshold on a graph like this, and we would say your hearing is normal. But if I have to increase the intensity more and more and more before you're able to detect it, before you go, oh, now I can hear it, that indicates some level of hearing loss. And the further down the graph, I have to mark your threshold or your ability to hear, that suggests that you need quite a bit of intensity in order to perceive it. Here's the same graph, but now overlaid with sounds from the everyday environment. So we have things like rustling leaves at the very top of the graph, and down at the bottom are very loud sounds, lawn mowers, bands, firecrackers, things like that. But I want to draw your attention to this yellow shape. We call this the speech banana, and it accounts for the majority of American speech sounds, where they fall on an average conversational level. I want to draw your attention to the right of this. Up at the top right, we have some of consonant sounds like F, S, and TH. They are soft and they are high pitch. And these particular speech sounds are the ones that individuals tend to lose access to first which is why my patients say, I'm having trouble distinguishing between words. Did you say wish, I wish upon a star, or did you say with, let's do something together? If you're not getting good access to high-pitched consonants, you're going to start to rely on your eyes or lip reading. You're going to start using more context to try to fill in the blanks. So in summary to this point, most hearing loss is sensory neural, most sensory neural hearing loss impacts the soft, high-pitched sounds first, which translates to the consonants that we find in our words, in our speech. So what does this mean now with masks? Masks are now part of society. Everyone is wearing them to stay safe, but they've done three things to our communication. The first is that they fundamentally distort the loudness as well as the quality of our speech. They block our mouths and our facial expressions, and they also change the psychology of our communication as well. So I'm going to go through these three points and highlight some different things for you to think about of how masks are impacting our communication for everyone, not just if you have a hearing loss. Masks are a physical barrier, duh, right? They're designed to keep things out and keep things in so that pathogens are not in the air. But sound waves also need to escape our mouth, travel through the air to be picked up by someone's ear and vice versa in order for us to carry a conversation. Depending on the material of the mask, the speech becomes muffled. There's sort of a hollow or resonant effect that happens inside of the mask because it's like a little cave around the mouth. And it can create some unnatural impact on sounds, particularly consonants. So remember what I said before, consonants tend to be high pitch. The length of the sound waves of a high pitch sound are very short, which means that they do not propagate through barriers as well as a low pitch sound. Low pitch sounds have a much longer sound waves and they can travel distances much more easily. Think of someone in your neighborhood using a leaf blower. You can hear that sound for miles because it's a very low pitch. And those sound waves are so long, they just travel and travel and they go through the trees and around houses. But high pitch sounds, because those wavelengths are so much shorter, they need significantly more energy to travel the same sort of distance. The Hearing Review recently did an informal study looking at the impact of masks on speech sounds. And they found exactly what we're talking about here, which is that wearing a mask attenuates high frequencies. 
And the thicker the mask, particularly the N95 mask, the more it degrades the high frequencies by as much as 12 dB, which is actually a lot. Decibels, or the intensity measurement we use for sound, is logarithmic, so 12 dB is many, many times of impact. We also made the point to say that if someone has a hearing loss already, on top of this loss of high-pitched sounds, that it may make speech sounds, or particularly consonant sounds, near unintelligible for them. One thing I've started saying is that for all of us who are wearing masks, it basically has given us a mild high-frequency hearing loss. Because of this loss of those high-pitched consonants, and if I already had a hearing loss of any degree, this impacts it even greater. So imagine how folks with really profound loss who are already struggling to hear these high-pitched consonants are now struggling even more. The second thing that masks do is they block lip reading. Our eyes and our ears are very tightly integrated and what you see will directly impact what you're hearing and vice versa. This is called the McGurk effect and I highly recommend that you Google or go to YouTube and search the Gurk effect. I put here a reference to Dr. Cliff, who's an audiologist. He did a really nice example of the McGurk effect on YouTube because it's almost like a magic trick, how you can't trust just one of your senses. They're so tightly connected that they, they impact each other and will trick you. And when one of your senses is challenged, you will quickly start using one of the other senses to fill in what your brain is not getting so that you can get a complete picture. We all lip read. Sometimes people assume that only individuals with hearing loss lip read, and that is not true at all. We all do a certain amount of it to supplement what we're hearing. We do more of it when the listening environment is complex. If there's background noise, if the lighting is poor, if there's multiple people talking, and we do it because it helps. Visual cues significantly impact our ability to understand speech. About 30 to 40% of speech sounds are visible on the lips. It's not 100% like spy movies might make you believe. But masks have completely taken away our ability to lip read for everyone. This is this crucial strategy for communicating well in difficult listening environments has been removed. Masks impact the way that we communicate on a psychological level. There's not a lot of research in this area at this time, although I'm sure we'll see it in the future, but by covering a significant portion of our face, we lose our ability to express ourselves. The subtleties of the emotion of my face help you understand the context of what I'm saying. Am I angry or am I making a joke? These types of subtext are lost when you can only see my eyes. This is going to result in misunderstandings for everyone. You may find that you're falling back on more superficial conversation with friends because it's so burdensome. But also masks right now are very, very symbolic. They're symbolic of this sudden and significant change to the way that we're living our lives. They represent risk. It's hard to have a conversation with someone who's wearing a mask and not start to think about, well, why are we wearing these masks? Oh, it's because you pose me a risk and I pose you a risk because we don't wanna get sick. And that is anxiety inducing. That may make you sad, it makes me sad. They're not physically comfortable. There's a lot of relief when you finally get home and can take your mask off. And we're not used to seeing them. Even those in healthcare settings who are used to working in healthcare didn't have to wear masks unless you were in a surgical environment. So because it's not the norm, it puts your brain on high alert. Something has changed, something is not right here. That is going to impact our communication. We're all experiencing really high levels of stress and that does not equal good communication at all. So we've laid the framework here. We've talked about what is hearing loss, how does hearing loss impact the way that we communicate, and now we've talked about how masks impact all of our communication, not just those with hearing loss. And yet, if I already had a hearing loss of any kind, even a mild hearing loss, masks are going to now make the communication that much harder. So what can I do? These are strategies for everyone, and these are strategies that should be used pandemic or not. 
These are things that should have been used all the time. But again, you don't know if the person you're talking to has a hearing loss. You can never assume. The number one thing you can do is be mindful of how distinct you're making your words and with a little bit more spacing, just slow down the rate of your speech slightly. By putting more space between the words, it gives the other person more time to process what you're saying. Okay, I didn't hear some of the words, but she's speaking slow enough that I can use context. Oh, that's what she said. I got it. And then you can keep following the conversation. Don't shout. There is a lot of times our first instinct is to start raising our voice in an unnatural way. But that actually may be further distorting speech and it's not sustainable or good for your voice. So it's much better to speak distinctly and as clearly as possible. Wave at the person, get their attention, maintain good eye contact when communicating. We should not be talking with our backs turned while walking away while in another room. Just not possible with the way that masks are distorting speech. By having good eye contact it means i'm being intentional and i have something to say to you try breaking the information into shorter sentences and repeat keywords this allows the person to better follow the conversation to digest the smaller sentences and by repeating keywords i can jump back into the conversation even if i miss the first thing that you said and as i already said don't assume that the other person is following or understanding even if you can tell they wear hearing aids or a cochlear implant. Until I can regrow those little hair cells inside the cochlea, hearing aids don't cure hearing loss. We're doing the best that we can with the technology that we have, but these strategies should be used even if someone is wearing a hearing aid. If you are the person listening, which hopefully you're taking turns with the person you're communicating with, you're not just the one speaking. Tell them you didn't understand. Let them know, I'm sorry, I missed that last part. Can you repeat it? Don't just bluff. We do a lot of smiling and nodding and bluffing when we don't understand. But maybe instead of just asking them to repeat what you missed, ask them to rephrase it. Try having them say it in another way or having them repeat just the part of it that you missed. This does a few things. The first thing it is that it indicates to the speaker that you were paying attention. You might repeat back, I heard you say this, but what about that last part? And that lets the speaker repeat just that specific part. And it speeds, it speeds up the repair. So they don't feel like they have to start completely all the way back again. The reality is that miscommunications annoy people. We do not like having to repeat ourselves. And if you have a hearing loss or your loved one has a hearing loss, you already know this. But miscommunications, unfortunately, even though they're not intentional, they just happen to all of us. They cause a lot of annoyance. People feel like, ugh, they're not paying attention. I have to start all over again. We just wanna keep talking and we wanna move on with our lives. Let's all be patient. Let's all recognize that masks are going to start impacting our communication. Repeat what you heard, and then ask them to rephrase or repeat just the bit that you missed. And then they can say, oh, it's John. That's who we're talking about. Great. We've repaired their communication, and now we can move on. If possible, think about your setting. Can I move away from some type of distracting noise? Even if the water is running in my kitchen, someone's doing the dishes, I cannot carry a conversation over that amount of noise. So move away from any distracting noise and have good lighting. If the information is really important, follow up with some sort of written communication, a text, an email. Hey, it was so nice running into you. We've decided we're gonna have a phone call later this week. I'm gonna text you so that the time in the day that we're going to talk. That way the person can follow up with maybe what they missed and the most important information has a backup, which is that written communication. It only takes a minute. These are masks with windows. They take a little bit more effort if you're sewing your masks at home, but these are some examples. The one on the left has a vinyl piece that's sewn in and that of course restores that ability to lip read, which can be very, very helpful if you're interacting with someone who is hard of hearing. If you work in healthcare, 
you already know how much of a challenge this is posing. It's necessary, we need masks. Don't be afraid to ask your patient how they are hearing. What could you do better to help them communicate better? Do they need an American Sign Language interpreter? Maybe that person could get by with lip reading and now they are really struggling. So please ask him if they need any type of interpreter. Use a live captioning service, and I'll come back to some links for that in just a second. But verify their comprehension with follow-up questions. Maintain that face-to-face -face communication, and you may want to use something like a pocket talker, which is an inexpensive amplifying device that you can get on Amazon. It consists of a headphone that the patient wears that's connected to what looks like a walkie-talkie with a boom mic. It has a very loud volume range and you basically speak into the microphone and it goes right into the headphones. Very, very helpful if the person you're talking to does not have their hearing devices with them so that you can communicate more easily. If you or a loved one has a hearing loss, please inform your healthcare provider as quickly as possible during a virtual or in-person visit that you're having difficulty understanding. I have a hearing loss, your mask is going to make it challenging. Here are some things, some very specific things that you can do to help me. So please be prepared to advocate for yourself. And if you have been avoiding seeing your audiologist or your ear, nose, and throat doctor, don't delay that care. Your hearing and your ability to communicate is an essential part of your overall wellness. And many offices are open. They're doing curbside cleaning like ours is. And if you've had any type of change in your hearing, that is urgent. That should be, it's not something that you wait six months because some of the things that need to be treated in a timely fashion. If you're admitted to the hospital with hearing loss, consider putting together a card like this that you would hand out, that you would put on your door. That tells everyone entering the room, I have a hearing loss, I'm going to struggle with your masks, I know the masks are necessary, but here are the things that you can do to help accommodate me. There are many types of speech to text apps. I use Otter, basically the person speaking into the smartphone and they're on the screen in real time, the speech is transcribed into words. This can be helpful if you're really struggling because the provider or a friend can speak right into the phone and the live captioning is occurring. You can then save that information as a note onto your phone and read it later. Highly recommend it. If you think you would use this type of app, now is the time to download it and practice using it, not when you've been admitted to the hospital. Some additional resources, the Hearing Loss Association of America has a great resource for individuals in the healthcare community, but also those who are admitted to the hospital, as well as this research center has similar types of resources. So I highly recommend that you look this up. In summary, masks make communication more difficult for everyone. This is twofold if I already have a hearing loss, and the greater the underlying hearing loss, the more masks are going to impact me. But with some effort and creativity, we're going to find solutions to overcome some of these challenges. We have to be creative. We have to be exceedingly patient with each other. If you've made it this far through the webinar, you now know more about hearing loss than ever. And the reality is that the communication strategies that I've talked about for speaking clearly should be used all the time because you do not know who has a hearing loss and who doesn't. And there are other types of auditory processing challenges that people may have unrelated to their ears who would benefit from clear communication. I also would add that the use of masks in general conversation now in the community may push some people with those mild borderline hearing losses to treat their hearing sooner. So maybe you've been getting by with a mild hearing loss, you know you're struggling, You've never been formally assessed, but as long as I can see the person's face, I can communicate well. Well, that may not be an option for a while, so I encourage you, even if you're on the fence, if you're just having some slight difficulty that now has gotten worse, get tested, see a doctor of audiology so that they can strategize with you. Hearing aids may not be what is needed at this time, but you do not need to struggle with no strategies at all. So there are other things that could be used to make your life better. 
So let's all start practicing these communication strategies now. Practice them in your home with your loved ones, even when you're not wearing masks so that when you get to the grocery store, when you get to your doctor's office, you're ready to go and you have these tools at the ready. It does take practice. This is my information. You are welcome to email me with any follow-up questions. I am a professor. I'm, I'm delighted to educate any and everyone about hearing loss. Patricia underscore Johnson at med.unc.edu. And there is also the clinic website, www.uncaudiology.org. So thank you so much for your attention. And thank you for going forth with better communication.